Our lives are like rivers that flow into the sea. Jorge Manrique, Coplas a la Muerte de su Padre. Welcome, hello again. Let's continue analyzing Cervantes' masterpiece. Don Quixote immediately observes that the original storyteller made a mistake because he had called the Breyers aldermen, regidores, instead of magistrates, alcaldes. Sancho objects that Don Quixote is being overly picky, adding that the aldermen might have become magistrates. Either way, Don Quixote and Sancho realize that these men are from the town offended at being mocked by their neighbors, whom they now plan to attack. Don Quixote approaches the ass banner and delivers a long harangue in which he urges the men to lay down their arms. Let's attend to Don Quixote's details and his meandering logic. First, Don Quixote points out that an entire town cannot be offended by a particular individual, but then he brings up a case in which this actually did happen. Diego Ordóñez de Lara, who upon the infamous murder of King Sancho II by Bellido Dolfos during the siege of Zamora, subsequently challenged the entire city. Don Quixote then points out that Ordóñez went too far, citing a popular ballad. Although it is true that Sir Don Diego went a little too far and even went beyond the limits of a proper challenge because he had no reason to challenge the dead, the water, the bread, the unborn, or all the other things that are mentioned there. Don Quixote argues it is absurd for people to go to war over name calling. No and no. God would neither want nor permit it. Next, mixing tradition and natural law, he gives four reasons why people and republics are indeed permitted to go to war. First, in defense of the Catholic faith. Second, in defense of one's own life, which is a natural and divine right. Third, in defense of one's honor. Fourth, in the service of one's king in a just war. Then he awkwardly adds a fifth reason, perhaps most related to the fourth, in defense of one's country. Note the tenuous status of this modern appeal to nationalism. The deeper problem, of course, is ancient. How is a just war defined? Don Quixote appeals to reason, saying that none of the five reasons for taking up arms apply in this case. He who takes them up for childish trifles and matters that are more laughable and amusing than offensive appears to lack all common sense. He goes even further, appealing to Christian morality, in particular, Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, which Cervantes cited in Latin in the prologue to Don Quixote part one. Taking unjust revenge, for there's no such thing as just revenge, goes directly against the holy law that we profess, according to which we are commanded to do good to our enemies and to love those who hate us. He concludes by triumphantly calling on these men to cease and desist. And so, dear sirs, your graces are obliged by laws both divine and human to make peace. Did you know, during the expansion of the Spanish Empire in the 16th century, intellectuals like Francisco de Vitoria, Bartolomé de las Casas, and Ginés de Sepúlveda debated whether Spaniards were acting in accord with the traditional requirements of just war. Sancho is impressed, marveling to himself that Don Quixote is a theologian. The devil take me if this my master isn't a theologian. And if he's not, well, he's as close as one egg is to another. Notice our access to Sancho's internal thoughts here and the equivalence between one egg and another. This is humanist morality on display. Hilariously, Sancho now takes his turn chastising the townsmen. It's foolish to get angry just because you hear somebody bray, but his mind wanders and he recalls his own braying abilities as a young man. I remember when I was a boy, I brayed where and whenever I wished without anybody holding me back. And with such grace and propriety that when I brayed, all the asses in the town brayed back. Sancho then gives the townsmen a sample of the science of braying. And so you'll see that I speak the truth. Wait and listen, for this science is like that of swimming. Once you learn, you never forget. It's an amazing moment. And then, his hand on his nose, he began to bray so loudly that all the nearby valleys echoed the sound. 
but the townsmen take offense and one of them strikes Sancho to the ground. At this point, all of the talk of violence and war in the past four chapters reaches a tipping point. Don Quixote's instinct is to avenge Sancho by attacking the man who struck him, but he is prevented from doing so, not because of Christ's injunction against revenge, but because he is outnumbered. But so many men got between them that it was impossible to avenge him. He retreats, checking his body for bullet holes as he flees. Meanwhile, the townsmen sling Sancho over his ass and let him go. Quixotic mission. Why does Sancho Panza complain at the end of the Brang adventure? A, his master abandoned him. B, his mother did not breastfeed him. C, his gray has died. Correct answer, A, his master abandoned him. The narrator's report of the townsmen's joy at their epic victory is hilarious. If they had known the ancient Greek tradition, they would have erected a monument at that very spot and place. Cervantes has reduced the most famous wars of classical history, such as the Trojan War, to a matter of bickering over ass calls. Thank you for joining me in this chapter. Hope you will join me in the next one too. If you liked this video and want to continue learning more about the knight errant Don Quixote de la Mancha, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel here. Also, you can enroll in our free online course on Don Quixote by clicking here.